Hi, my name is Aaron. I'm making this video in hopes to helping anybody going through depression, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, fearful and suicidal thoughts. I went through all of those at the same time and God delivered me from all of those. So I've been a born again Christian since I was 24 years old, I'm 35 now. And um, about a year and a half ago, <clears throat> this perfect storm started. And it was due to Korean ginseng that I received from my mother-in-law, which caused insomnia, which was a number one symptom, a side effect of it, and I didn't know about it. Um, I was taking it for 40 days, so I was having miserable sleep and I was doing whatever I could to get better. I didn't know what was wrong. And so that was uh, leading me to a time of just panic. And I consulted doctors, got prescription medications, did cognitive behavioral therapy. And during that time, a little bit of a panic attack was developed. I didn't know what panic attacks even were. I just called it triggers. That's how ignorant I was. I never went through any of these symptoms before. No anxiety, panic attacks, depression, suicidal thoughts. Um, yeah, I never went through this stuff and I didn't even know what they were. Um, <clears throat> so I started to have a little bit of those symptoms, but at the end of 40 days, I just surrendered to God. And basically I heard him speak to me through a thought and I've never heard God speak. And I didn't hear him audibly here, but this was my first time where I recognized it was God where it was just like a foreign thought. I knew it wasn't for me, it was a question. And it said, God said, you know, what has changed in the last 40 days? So I thought about it and I answered the Korean ginseng. And I looked it up, that's what the side effect was. I stopped taking it, I thank God, I thought it was over, but it was just the beginning. So by then, the panic attacks and the anxiety already set in. And sleep is a really weird thing. You know, it's, it, you just, you can't just sleep because you want to, you know, it needs to come on its own. It's very, it's kind of um, mysterious. But um, <clears throat> I didn't know this. And so I started getting panic attacks even after I stopped taking the ginseng. And that made me panic even more, even more I didn't know what was wrong with me. I started to reason maybe the chemicals have damaged my brain. And so I started to get these panic attacks at night that would just uh, bring me to a cold sweat. My whole body would become clammy. I, my back would be all wet. The bed would be wet from just my sweat. And I couldn't go to sleep, obviously. Just these, um, my heart would just be racing and it would go to a point of just pounding really hard to the point where my chest would just throb. And the problem with these is that it just, you know, I get it at night, but then in the daytime it stops, the panic attacks stop, but the throbbing doesn't stop. It just starts hurting so bad. And the throbbing hurts so bad that it would just bring me to tears. I just break down all throughout the day. And at work, just my dress shirt would just be wet on both arms, just with my drying my tears. I just couldn't take it. And so after the 40 days, um, <clears throat> these panic attacks were just eating me alive. And of course, I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with me. So I consulted psychologists, um, therapists, went to the doctor and got a total of six prescription medications. None of those medications helped. Every single one had the opposite effect of what I was hoping for. Like sleeping pills made me sleep less anti-anxiety drug, one of them made me stay up just about two whole days in a row. And it was torture. And the side effects on those sleeping pills, by the way, are very scary. I started to, I like woke up one night and just started doing things without me remembering what I did. Like I woke up my wife really late, 12, 1 a.m. and started having a conversation with her. And she said, I went down and started trying to fix the dehumidifier, just things that didn't make sense. And that, of course, made me very worried. Um, so drugs were not an option, but I was still trying to figure it out. You know, maybe there's another drug out there and every single one was harming me so bad, so I was scared to take it. And thank God none of those drugs worked because if they did, I would have never got better. I would have been dependent on those drugs and never found the victory in Jesus. 
So <clears throat> I started to go downhill with these panic attacks. And what that did was develop anxiety in my mind. And so I kept on worrying and these fears would permeate my mind to the point where my attention span was pretty much maybe four seconds or less. It was just non-existent. I could not just think straight. I just kept on dwelling on these fearful thoughts. And as I became more hopeless and more hopeless through seeing that there was no way out, I started to enter a very deep depression. I've had mild depression just one time in my life when I came into salvation, but this was just a different um, level. It's, it deserves a different name. You just can't call them depression. Um, this is just eating me from the inside out. And so I did get just mildly depressed in the beginning of this trial where I just secluded myself from others. But at a certain point, where I was becoming increasingly desperate and I became so desperate that I felt like a guy that was drowning, just coming up for air, trying to grab whatever I could to survive. So I started to go out and just ask everybody I possibly could, is there any way you can help me? This is what I'm going through. Can anyone help me? And I was admitted to the mental hospital for two weeks. There was no help there. It was even actually more depressing. Just so many people that were in despair with no way out, it seemed like. The only people that seemed to be doing okay were people that were highly um, drugged. And even in that case, it just, it doesn't seem good. The side effects are horrible for some of the drugs. And as I mentioned, none of the drugs worked for me. Like even one of the drugs that the psychiatrist at the mental hospital put me on, it made my back have a burning sensation at night. I mean, that is just counter helpful. It, this, none of the drugs did anything but harm me. And like I said, I thank God for that. So the mental hospital didn't work. I even went to Christian counseling and that did not help. But there was one Christian counseling I'll explain later that did help incredibly. And I read the Bible on my own a lot. I sang songs, I uh, prayed a lot. There was no help. I felt like God just wasn't listening. I don't. I couldn't understand why he let me go through this. And I was getting really angry with God. Um, you know, there's a lack of faith that I could see, of course. And I was so upset with God. Like, how could you let me suffer this bad? I know I'm your child. You saved me about 10 years ago. Everything was going great. And now this. This is the worst possible storm I could ever imagine, Lord. But I didn't know about the sufferings of Jesus that we were to share in the suffering with him and, and then the good that comes from suffering. I didn't know any of this. You know, I thought if I was a Christian, everything would be just smooth and good. But the thing was, over the last 10 years, I've been seeking God, like especially the last five years in a much deeper way. I just wanted more of him being filled and God was answering my prayer. And after I became just completely desperate, um, I started to contemplate suicide and it became very serious. And I have two young daughters and a wife, of parents, you know, younger brother. And every time I had that shotgun to my head, I just could not get over just worrying about my daughters. Yeah, of course, my wife and my parents and everyone else too, but I, mean, I, I felt really bad towards them too. I was thinking, you know, how are they gonna handle this? How are they gonna carry on? Um, but my two daughters, those sweet, innocent girls, I was like, are they gonna enter depression and anxiety later when they find out like how I went? And then I just didn't know, you know, being raised without a dad and I, all these fears went into my head. That was probably good fear. So that prevented me from pulling the trigger many times. And um, I just lacked faith. You know, I'm a praise, I was a praise band leader and I would preach so much and call to worship to trust God. <laughs> All these Bible verses, because it resonated with me. And yet, I realized I was preaching to myself for this time. But my faith was so pathetic. I realized I didn't trust God. 
even though I was saved. So I couldn't kill myself and I couldn't live. I didn't know how to live. So I was just stuck in torment. That's what my life was. It was being tortured by panic, attack, panic attacks at night, cold sweats, and it's not like just staying up watching movies or anything. It is like cold sweats, chest hurting, white face, panicking all night, and then you see the sun come up and you gotta get ready for work. And then the work time, your chest is hurting. Your heart is pounding so bad, it's bringing you to your knees, even at work, just crying. And then the depression is just eating and gnawing, taking huge chunks of your heart at a time. And you know, I lost 15 pounds because of that. And the fearful thoughts just permeating your mind. And even one of the insomnia techniques from a PhD was you have to think of happy thoughts when you're sleeping at night. I couldn't eventually. I started, when I closed my mind and started imagining myself in a happy place, I was depressed even in my imagination. So there's no way out. So I came to a place where I was at the end of myself. I just had no options left. I remember I just lay down on the bed. And I said, I don't even care if I live or die anymore. I just don't care. And I went to bed. That was like the first night I got a decent amount of sleep. I woke up the next day and I noticed a little something a little different. The pain was still raging in me, but I think my depression left. Either it got a lot better or it just left. Can't really tell because there's too many symptoms all going on at the same time. This perfect storm. It's like having lightning, winds, crushing waves, and then just, you know, one of them going out. You could kind of notice it, but the other thing is just killing you. It's hard to notice. So as I was going through that, the very next day, my dad recommends a book to me. And it's only by the grace of God that I accepted this book and just read it. Because before then, I listened to sermons and other things, and it just went into one year and out the other. So this book was called Handbook to Happiness by Charles Solomon. My dad read it about a year or two ago, uh, before the time that I read it. And he mentioned that there was this man named Charles Solomon, the author, writing about his experience, the mental anguish that he was going through. And he said the way he described it just didn't seem believable. It, you've never heard of any kind of mental anguish in that way. It sounded more painful to getting your arm chopped off. You know, it sounded more painful to getting attacked by sharks, attacked all up here. And when he, he my dad was of great help. He basically, um, we talked on the phone maybe an hour to three hours every day. Um, and he said, Aaron, what you're going through sounds pretty much the same of what Charles Solomon was going through. I think you should read this book. And so, Half dead, I opened that book up, I started reading it, and then I saw myself in that book. What he went through, I saw myself just walking in his shoe. And he just, just started explaining how God uses this trial in a Christian's life to bring him to the end of himself so that that Christian can die to himself. You know, so that you can deny yourself Carry your cross and follow him. So I started to have hope. It's like, God, is that what you're doing? Are you crushing me? Are you breaking me? Like a seed that needs to shell, that needs to be broken in order for the life within to come out. Are you doing that to me, Lord? And so I had a little glimmer of hope for the first time since this trial started. And so later it turns out to be not just enough hope, but it was the life-giving message and uh, leading me to the Bible that restored me completely. So as I started to, after I read that book, I started to read other books like Watch Mini, uh, The Normal Christian Life, which I highly recommend. And it's all about basically coming to the end of yourself so that you can no longer live, you forfeit your life, and you reckon that you were crucified with Christ on that cross and that you died with him and that you were dead and buried. But when you rose again, yourself stayed in the grave, but you came up with Christ in you as a new creature. And now with Christ in you, it means that now you live a life that is dedicated to God. And what that means and the best way to live that is for him to live his life in and through me. 
So I was still in the driver's seat and God was teaching me to get out of the driver's seat and for him to step in and run my life. And that sounds like a cute little youth group story, but that is not cute or easy whatsoever. It is literally to deny yourself, to die to yourself, to carry your cross, to reckon that you died with him, that you are no more but is Christ living in and through you, that his will becomes your will and that you can follow him in that way. So that is the message I was getting and I believed it. And I started to believe even more. And what I mean by that, I started to believe in the promises of the Bible. So this led me to believing everything God said in the Bible and reckoning them all as true. So while I was going through this hardship, um, I remember two weeks out of um, receiving that book and reading it. Like I received, um, I got like a, a divine message from God that just helped me in my, the bottom of my pit. I remember I was just getting pummeled with suicidal thoughts still. I was getting pummeled with the heart just hurting me, the chest pains. And I remember just taking a shower in the morning and like, God, I can't do it anymore. I just can't. I have no strength in me. I have nothing left. I don't know if I could even make it into work. I said, God, help me. And that's all I said to him. And I got into work. And the, a Facebook message came up and it said, this is what you wrote a year ago. You know, those little one year things. And it said that I wrote, and I didn't even know what this really meant because I wrote it a year ago, but I heard it from my dad and it sounded good. And I started praying for it too. I said, I realize it's not about asking God to give me this or give me that, but it's about asking him to live his life in and through me and for his will to become my will. I realized that is what it means to live an abundant life. Something along those lines. And so God spoke to me in that way. I took that as God answering my prayer that morning. I'm letting you go through this trial so that your prayer can be answered. I'm answering your prayer, which aligned perfectly with the Handbook to Happiness book and the Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee. God was bringing me into the death of him on the cross so that I could recognize my identity, my rightful legal identity in Christ, that I am a child of God, that I am in him, with him seated in the heavenlies, as the Bible says, and that Christ is living in me. So I started to believe that. And uh, that gave me a jolt of hope. <clears throat> but the suicidal stops wouldn't stop. Even though I didn't want to die anymore, they were like coming in like just rushing waters into my mind. I couldn't stop it. And the scary thing is, every time I thought about killing myself, it would bring me a sense of peace. And I know now it's from the devil, but yeah, these thoughts just kept on coming. I knew I didn't want it. And I was listening, listening to Dr. Neil Anderson. And the most important teaching that I got from him, and he teaches a lot, and he is a great man of God and a help in destroying the strongholds and taking back territory from the demons, is that he said, when you're thinking thoughts that you do not want to think, they are not from you. I'll say that one more time. If you're thinking of anything that you don't want to think about, they're not from you. I just thought about that. And I believed it. It made sense. So I said, you know, if I don't want to think about these thoughts and they're not from me, then who is it from? It's definitely not from God. I really, it's from the devil. So by faith, I believe this. And I verbally said this out loud, in the name of Jesus Christ, be gone evil spirits and your thoughts. And the moment I said that, those thoughts just stopped. And I could hardly believe it at the moment because it just became quiet. It was like just that roaring water of suicidal thoughts were coming and all of a sudden, this giant iron wall going like a thousand feet into the ground just stopped the dead cold. And so I waited like a minute. I was expecting it to come back and it didn't. I waited an hour, a day later, year and a half later, it's still gone. It completely stopped. It was the name of Jesus that made the evil spirits and their thoughts go away. I had no idea that it was demons giving me those thoughts. And so, yeah, I believed in demons and angels, but I've never 
been attacked by them in this blatant way before. So all of a sudden they became real. And so I started to armor up in God, in the Ephesians, you know, where all you put the helmet, breastplate, belt, sword. I started meditating on that. And I started listening to way more of Neil Anderson, um, Martin Lloyd-Jones, and a lot of other teachers and spiritual warfare. And that was so crucial to me. I realized I was fighting in this world just butt naked. And God was telling me, look, you know about all the armors. They're on the ground. Through this trial, I'm teaching you, pick it up and put it on. And that's what I did. I put on the armor of God. I rebuked the evil spirits in Jesus' name. And I started fighting back by believing in his promises. When the devil started to just fill me with his lies and his words, <clears throat> it was the word of God that trumped the devil's lies and his words. So I want to get to the meat of how I was delivered from the, these uh, symptoms and this just overall trial. So number one thing was rebuking those suicidal thoughts. You know, that's the first thing, but that's not the meat. That was crucial. And I recommend everyone to do that. Rely on the name of Jesus to stop any kind of evil thoughts coming into your mind because he will stop them for you. He will fight for you. But what healed me was the word of God. Okay, if I can put this whole testimony in a nutshell, when the whole world couldn't heal me, the psychologists, doctors, prescription drugs, mental hospital, CB, cognitive behavioral therapy, like a PhD in insomnia, uh, when none of it could heal me, instead I was healed by the word of God. That's my testimony. His word is true, it's living, can be trusted, and that's what saved me. So I want to go into detail on how I was saved. And so I had like a new Bible verse almost every single day that I hung on to with my life. Okay, like Isaiah, a lot of the promises came from there. I think it was like, I don't remember the verses that well, but I can remember the meat of it, like Isaiah 41.10 maybe. You know, it was like, I am... Like, do not be afraid for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know, you hear something like that and it's a promise saying that don't be afraid. I'm literally with you. In fact, I'm living inside of you. Do not be anxious. Don't be dismayed for I am your God. And I thought about the Israelites, how they were taken care of by God, especially in Canaan when God was fighting for them. And he promised that he will strengthen me and help me. And he'll uphold me with his righteous right hand. You know, and like in 1 Peter, where you cast all your anxieties onto God. Those, I mean, these are the most powerful life-giving words. It says, humble yourself before his mighty hand. So I said, God, I surrender. I acknowledge that I don't have the strength. These mental illnesses, as the world puts them, are too much for me. They're so heavy. They're crushing me. I totally admit it. I can't handle it. Even the whole world and everything in it can't help me, but you can. So I humble myself before your mighty hand and I cast it all onto you. Everything. And as I did that in faith, God started to give me more faith. He started to give me the ability to rest in him. But the three core Bible verses I want to share that I still hang on to. All those other verses are wonderful and I'll look back on them. But the three I have memorized just, uh, just helps me in every aspect of my life. Is first, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for thee. You know that? I meditated on that a long time. I listened to sermons on it. And the biggest takeaway <clears throat> is that my grace is sufficient for you. And so I don't, even need to, I don't need to pray for it, beg for it, ask for it. God said, it's yours. It's available now. It'll always be enough for you. My grace will sustain you. It'll give you what you need to succeed today as a child of God, behaving as a child of God. And I just took him at his word. I said, you know, I'm just going to trust you that your grace is enough. And then combine that <clears throat> excuse me, with Romans 8.28 that he will use all things for my good. And mind you, this only is true for children of God. Okay, because it says that for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I realized, I just meditated on that promise. Lord, you're going to use everything for my good? 
Well, that's what the Bible says. Everything from tying my shoes to eating my lunch to enduring all the panic attack, uh, suffering through depression, anxiety, insomnia. He's going to use all of that for my good. The Lord of the universe promised it. He created the stars and the earth, everything with his words. And so how much more will these promises be true and sustain me? And so I thought about those two. And uh, when I was going to sleep at night with the panic attacks, I dwelled on those two truths. Whether I get no sleep today, however much sleep I get today or not, his grace will sustain me tonight with the suffering I'm going to go through tonight. Like I even seen like some bright flashes in my eye in a pitch dark night and it is just freaky stuff. You know, I said, it doesn't matter. My face sweating, my back being on fire, feeling it doesn't matter. His grace will sustain me. And on top of that, he's going to use all of that suffering for my good. So what is there to be scared of? If I get so little sleep tomorrow, he's going to use that for my good. And one of the things that was obviously used for my good was in my brokenness, you know, when you fast and you're really tired, uh, sleepy, I'm sorry, when you fast, you're really hungry. Well, when you're really sleepy, you're so weak as well. You have like no strength. And through my weakness, God's strength was made uh, like visible to me and even others. And so I trusted in those two promises. No matter how much sleep I get, no matter how much pain I endure, his grace will sustain me, allowing me to even ch behave as a child of God and that he's going to use everything for my good. And third, Galatians 2.20, it doesn't matter how I feel or how much faith I even have in it. It's a truth. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is a truth just laid out. There is no questions about what it means. It means that I really hung on the cross with Jesus on that day and I died with him. You have to believe that if you're a believer, this is your legal right. Just as when Adam sinned, we were in Adam when you sinned and we were all fallen. You know, we were separated from God, destined for hell. We were also in Jesus as he hung on the cross and we died with him. That old man, Adam, that we inherited from Adam, it died that day. <clears throat> so once you're dead, you're not coming back. That part of you, you're dead, who you were. But now it says you, it's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. So you have a new identity. You have the bloodline of Jesus. You know, you're in him and he's in you. So that verse was extremely powerful because all the problems that I was facing, if it's not me who's living, but Christ who's living in me, these are not my problems. It's all God's problems. It's him that needs to handle it and he will handle it because he said he would. He said he would uh, save me from all my afflictions in Psalms. <clears throat> so through hanging on to these promises, I was healed. But let me go into a little detail on this because everyone has like a little bit of a different story. And Charles Solomon, the author I mentioned to you, he was healed instantly one night. He was just at the end of his robes and he was just uh, suffering so much. And he opened the Bible at like midnight and he re read Galatians 2.20. So I have been crucified with Christ. And when he read those words, his neck pain just went away. Depression fell away. Inferiority complex, gone. Don Higgins, another man that I really look up to, uh, when he found out that in a seminar that Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, and that he didn't, and Don Higgins, he didn't need to do anything to earn uh, salvation, earn, I, he, I don't think he had a question on that, but he didn't need to do anything more. Jesus did it all for him. When he realized that his body and mind was just healed, like on the spot, his body actually healed over time after that, but his mind was just completely healed from what I understand. So I was praying for that. It's like, God, just heal me instantly. You know, just like those guys, but he didn't. And I thank him that he didn't because <clears throat> if he healed me instantly, at least for me, 
um, I would have probably not been able to trust him, at least um, like I do now. So it was a span of three months that I had to endure where I had to just take him at his word each moment. And this was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And the challenge was don't kill yourself. It was so hard, you know, not to want to kill myself, especially in, um, before I got to the point where, you know, I was able to rebuke those thoughts in Jesus name. But even then it was extremely difficult. And of course of three months without me even realizing it, my chest pain was gone. My depression was absolutely nowhere in sight. My mind was restored. The anxiety was gone and I was sleeping. Like I just trusted God. That's what let me sleep. Um, it was just an amazing journey. It was difficult, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. And um, if you're going through something like this, when you start trusting God and your mind starts healing, it takes time, at least for me. It's like kind of being chased by a wild animal in the forest and you see like an iron house <clears throat> and you finally get into the house, you shut the door and you know you're completely safe. And uh, even though you know you're safe, your emotions takes a while to catch up to the reality that you're safe. So give it some time. And that analogy was given to me by Dr. Woodward, John Woodward. And he has a great ministry in Tennessee, Grace Fellowship International. It's actually founded by Charles Solomon, who I mentioned, and I highly recommend him. He's the only counselor that was able to help me, you know, along with my dad. And he led me to help me, it led me to die to myself, to surrender everything, and to just simply trust him and rest in him. So I recommend to anybody that is going through this to get good counseling from not just any Christian counseling, but a good one where they lead you to total surrender, to give up on yourself, to trust and rest in God. And there's phone counseling available with Grace Fellowship International. So <clears throat> yeah, over those three months, I was completely healed. And I, um, I have been totally free of all those things. And sometimes I will be scared still, you know, not as much anymore, but even after a year, I sometimes get scared of those sleep things that I went through, but then it will be easily snuffed out by those three promises. Second Corinthians 12, nine, Romans eight twenty eight, and Galatians 2, 20. When you hold on to those truths, it really snuffs out all the lies. They just can't stand in the face of God's word and his truth. So I hope this testimony has helped you. And uh, if you're going through any suicidal thoughts at this time, uh, don't give in. I'm telling you, you don't have to do it. There's no reason for you to have to do that. God is enough. Jesus will take care of you. He is sufficient. His grace is enough. And he's going to use what you're going through right now for your good. And through the healing that you receive from him, he's going to turn it around and let you heal others with that same kind of healing. Your testimony is in the making. If you're a believer of God, believe me. He is using this trial of yours to shape you, to mold you, and to be a test, make another testimony to exalt his name and free others who are in bondage. So if you have any questions or if you need any prayers, just leave a comment and let me know. God bless you.